I'm a general dentist, and like most of us, I always wonder what centric relation is. What is CR? And about four or five years ago, I sat in this room and I was talking to Dr. Piper and listening to him lecture. And I think I figured it out. And I'd like Dr. Piper to take it from there. I mean, what is CR? Please tell the dentist what is CR. Well, I think to understand what it is, you have to understand what it's not. You have to start with a totally normal TMJ. And I think a lot of times we make assumptions that our patient has a normal TMJ, even though there may be things that we see from the foundation to indicate that the joint's bad. For example, a child patient, uh, class two anterior open bite. Many times they have no pain, uh, but technically they may have injury to their TMJs because their mandible's not growing normally. Right. And so we could say, well, we're gonna put the patient in CR to treat their bite, or the general dentist wants the orthodontist to do that. Uh, but the problem conceptually, again, is that it, they're not in CR if, they're, if their disc is not in place. It doesn't matter what their pain is doing. It's a structural issue. So to me, CR is very clearly defined as a patient who has both joints, disc in place on top of the condyle at both poles right. with the condyle fully seated. Now to most dentists, CR is a technique to try to uh, manipulate the condyles as high as possible right. into, the, into the fossa of the TMJ. And that's actually fairly straightforward to do if we have a normal disc. But where they struggle is using a technique to get the condyle fully seated when the disc is damaged or partially dislocated or something like that. But in that case, that's not CR. Okay, you know, so CR is a very strict definition. Both joints, both discs have to be totally normally aligned with the condyles seated. I think where dentists miss, on, miss out on this is the, they don't realize, they don't think orthopedically. They don't think about ligaments and they don't think about the disc. They think about it abstractly, but not in the practical sense. So the way I understand it, a centric relation by definition, for it to exist, you need to have ligaments that are intact on both lateral and medial pole. Is that accurate? But that's totally accurate, but you know, it's kind of understandable how this evolved. Yeah. Uh, because before imaging, dentists were trying to figure out the most appropriate treatment position. So a treatment position would simply be posture of the mandible, from which you build or adjust the bite. That's a treatment position. And, and fully seated condyles uh, for many patients and, and by many dentists will be the treatment position. Now we know from imaging that, that there are those patients who actually have mechanical strain mm -hmm. to the disc when they're in a fully seated position. And so, you know, we kind of have this, we kind of have this world out there uh, where I think to most dentists, CR means fully seated condylar position. Uh, CR though, many times is ACP, which would be adapted centric posture, meaning that the disc is damaged, but maybe the joint foundation is stable and projects to be stable as the condyle is seated inside the TMJ. So in, in that case, the treatment position, in other words, where to place the mandible to treat the bite, may be the same in CR as it is in adapted centric posture. Right. Begs the question, which patients are not adapted and which patients have a joint foundation that probably is going to change over time. And in those cases, we may be better off not choosing fully seated condylar position as our treatment position. And that's, that's where imaging can actually benefit us.
you know, until I was imaging soft tissue, which means the MRI, I wasn't able to truly tell if someone was an adapted centric posture or not adapted. Um, also, you know, another problem I think we have with the profession is the fact that we've all learned this dogmatic approach of treating this CRCO slide. As a general dentist, that's what I was taught in school. That's what most postgraduate education taught me um, after I got out of school. The reality is, you know, and we've talked about this in other videos, um, maximum intercuspation is usually the place where the body wants things. Hence, I mean, the teeth are there for a reason. Is that not a fair statement? And I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm not trying to say it's completely wrong to go and treat traditionally eliminating the CRCO slides. What I'm trying to say is most of the time we don't have to go there. And what stinks for the profession, I shouldn't say this, but there's less money to be made. There's less revenue to be generated if you're not altering a bite in that regard. Well, if, if you kind of make that the side issue, the central issue really is, is the patient better off treating to fully seated condylar position mm -hmm. or are they better off selecting a different treatment position? You know, there's always been a concept of treatment position. Sure. It's just that most dentists assume that treatment position is selected from response that the patient has with pain. Yeah. And in, in looking at joint foundations, what we realize is that uh, pain, is, pain is a secondary occurrence to a mechanical problem many times. And the mechanical problem, it depends how you define it. You could look at a bite and say, well, there's muscle pain because the bite is distorted. And then it begs the question, well, but why is the bite distorted? And the bite may be distorted because the joint is mechanically distorted, okay? So if, if you look at the whole system, not just the bite and the muscles, but also the joint foundation, then the concept that we follow and teach at PERC basically is that treatment position is selected as that position where you project that the anatomy in the joint won't change. That's adaptation. So that's so-called adaptation of the bite. And we'll see patients in whom treatment position is selected incorrectly. Right. Uh, and not that the dentist knew that it was incorrect, but the outcome was that the treatment position led to instability in yeah. the joint, which in turn led to instability in the bite. Okay, so again, I think it gets back, we have tools now uh, to be able to understand exactly what the status of the joint may be, and those tools help us extrapolate the behavior pattern of the joint foundation and by doing that you can extrapolate what the bite is going to do. Okay, so the world of empirical treatment, uh, I mean you can still do it and you may be correct part of the time, uh, but then those patients who fail need better answers. Sure. than empirical treatment. And the question is, well, are they the only ones who deserve a good foundation diagnosis? Or should we do that with everybody? And, um, you know, there are certainly extremes. I'm at one extreme because I look at the foundation in every patient, okay. but I also have a selected population. I have a population that has foundational issues, they have bad bites, they have pain, and so forth. So in a general dental practice, is it practical to image the foundation in every patient? And I would say, to a degree, yes, uh, because we're imaging the foundation of the teeth, mm -hmm. right? We're imaging the periodontium, sure. we're imaging the teeth themselves, and 
it may extrapolate, therefore, that we should also do an imaging diagnosis of the joint foundation. And so if you could do that uh, in the past, it was done with tomography or a panorex or whatever, now with CT. I think if dentists have good guidelines on generating the CT position for the joint, they can get a lot of information about the foundation. So it's right there. It's in the, it's in the imaging that we're already doing. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, you know, a lot of times on forums, I'll have someone upload something and say, hey, what do you think of this scan, uh, a CT scan, for example? And my first question is, you gotta, or they'll ask a question of the group. My first question to them is, you have to define where you've taken the scan at what bite position. You know, that and also in the literature, I've noticed that there's that huge discrepancy. Radiology and uh, oral maxillofacial surgery and the dental literature, whenever they're talking about joint scans, they're not indicating consistently where they're shooting that film from. Mm -hmm. Hence, if you try to look back and do some kind of retrospective study, you can't really find the correlation because it matters. It matters if they're fully seated, it matters if they're in an MIP, it matters if they're at IEP, wherever they may be, you know, whatever bite position makes a difference. I think there's a very simple concept uh, for dentists to understand, yeah. and that is that there is a diagnostic position, you know, the position that you do all of your testing from, right. and that may not correlate to the treatment position. Right. Okay, so as an example, uh, I always take a fully seated bite registration. Sure to generate the CT scan. Uh, because I know if I'm going to use the CT of the TMJ to give me information about the foundation, I have to see the bone structure in the joint, and I have to see if there's distortion of the spatial relationship. Since we're gonna do a CT anyway, if we take a fully seated condyle, what many dentists would call CR, if we're taking that position in the joint, recording it in a bite registration, having them wear the bite registration to generate the CT. Right. Now we have that diagnostic position. Uh, and it kind of makes sense. I mean, we, we very oftentimes get mounted study casts. Sure. And they're in fully seated condylar position. Uh, we want to do at least one MR sequence in that. And there, there was a time that we really looked to see if we could use that fully seated position as our treatment position. So we would plan the bite uh, from the study casts and everything, but um, <clears throat> that's really the whole point of this discussion. That may not be the best treatment position. Now we understand it in the pain world, because in the pain world we would select a treatment position as a posture where the condyle's not fully seated where the condyle is down and forward at the point where the patient has either acceptable discomfort or, or no pain. And that became the pain-based treatment position. Well, we can use MR now, magnetic resonance imaging, to get an anatomically based treatment position. Right. So it's just expanding a concept that we've had there for a long time about where we're going to treat and plan the bite. And uh, so it, the whole point is there is a diagnostic position for the joint, but that may not be the joint position that we're going to plan our treatment. There are lots of other factors that have to be put into the overall diagnosis to get to that point. And wouldn't it be a fair statement to say that um, if you're going to have a damaged joint, the centric relation, quote unquote, or adapted centric posture, non-adapted centric posture, by definition, if it's one of those three things, um, aren't you going to be in the most amount of trouble if you're treating uh, or say reconstructing a bite in to CR? Well, in again, general, again, if you had to generalize. Well, I, I guess um, 
It, it, it very much depends on the foundation. Yeah. But I, I do a lot of reconstruction with fat grafts. And uh, so when you surgically build a new disc out of fat, uh, there, there's a lot of change in the bite. And what I find is extrapolating to the surgery or surgical population, if we try to treat to a seated condyle, we're going to see progressive breakdown of the fat graft. Yeah. So in the surgical population, I've extrapolated the treatment position basically to maximal intercuspation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there is there is a slide. You know, when you manipulate those patients, there's there's premature contact on their molars, and they slide forward. Now we have to watch for two things. We have to watch for local factors where you see problems with tooth integrity. Maybe the tooth is getting loose from too much occlusal trauma, and you have to modify that slide. You have to modify the degree of force put on that tooth, or there may be a muscle component. Sure. Now, what I've learned from the surgery population is that the muscle component is not automatically caused by posterior prematurities. In fact, many times uh, muscle pain goes down, but we're breaking old rules and treating the MIP. Right. And you could say, well, but it's a different population, and it is. You know, it's a population that's been reconstructed. It kind of begs the question, is it, is it the occlusion that's driving muscle, spain, muscle pain and spasm, or is there some other cofactor that maybe we're not recognizing? And that's where sympathetic nerves and, and CRPS type 1 probably become part of the picture. At the CNO, at my little teaching facility, um, when doctors come and they learn from us, we're telling them to uh, scan an MIP. And let me tell you why. Because we're treating typically either in MIP or slightly down and forwards. So our treatment position is based upon objectively measured imaging. CT and MRI both in the cases where we have to go to MRI, which I know you totally get that, but the audience probably doesn't get that. I think it's really important to make this statement. In general, um, we weren't taught to measure uh, the two hinges. The two hinges being the two TMJs. We're taught to take impressions, use articulating paper, uh, look, we understand the concepts of group function and anterior guidance, but we've never really put numbers to it. So everything that we are, are all about at the CNO is trying to put a number to things. So, and I believe the perk, I, we share that philosophy in a big way. You taught me a lot of that. What do, you, what do you have to say about that? I mean, I think we should make a point. If you can put a number to something, that by definition is a fact, correct? If you can't, I would call that an opinion. So, I think the problem that most dentists have, and most dental professionals, is that we've been taught something, and we take, we, it's dogmatic. We believe it to be true. But all of a sudden, when you start challenging that and you start putting numbers to things, you realize that, oh my gosh, it's really not true. What, and I can, I can tell you that since learning from you how to scan an image, I'm able to put numbers to the joint, both joints. And I'm able to put numbers with computers to the occlusion and the muscle. When I combine all of that data, it lets me do things that people think are impossible. I can't fix everybody but I can usually diagnose most everybody, at least get them there as a general dentist. And the interesting thing in my path, in my career, what's been going on the last five years or so, if I can't figure it out, there are people like you out there that can take over. But to, just to identify to the, for the patient, that, that in itself is a massive service. And I think that's extremely important. And I want to thank you because without your tutelage, I wouldn't know that. And I want to continue to thank you because I learn from you every time that I spend time with you.